Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you to, uh, to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk, which is a little bit different, I think. On the other hand, what I will be doing is uh, building on or emphasizing um, some things that have been brought up by a lot of other speakers through uh, this morning and probably will be touched on by other speakers later uh, today and in the conference. So um, I started this talk with a blank slate and I thought there's no way I'm going to fill 25 minutes. Um, Clearly, I'm going to fill 25 minutes. Um, so the, this is a general outline of what I want to go through, is one of the real challenges in assessing safety and toxicity is the lack of good and validated preclinical models. Talk about the issue of transgene toxicity directly, um, which has been touched on. Talk about, in, in genome editing, there's a lot of talk about off-target effects, but actually I think we need to spend time thinking about the on-target toxicity of the double-stranded break. Um, we just heard a great talk about the immunologic toxicity to the vector and to transgenes, and I'll give uh, one more example of that that actually uh, Tony Cathoman mentioned. Um, I, I'm going to give two slides or a couple slides on um, some of the ethics of gene therapy and genome editing, um, particularly as it re relates to risk benefit. Um, and then finally, review just two examples of, of what the FDA uh, has either approved or has given a plan for in terms of what they're going to require for genome editing based um, of, of hematopoietic stem cells. Now, I'll admit um, my, my background's in genome editing and, and I know more about the hematopoietic system, so a lot of the examples I use are from those two systems, but by no means uh, should you consider it restricted to those systems, m many of the general issues I'm going to bring up. So uh, what are the important safety concerns that we have? I think the most important uh, safety concern is, a, is this issue of malignant transformation. Does our gene therapy uh, vector or do the cells that we engineer somehow lead to a pathologic transformation? But there are others, including the possibility that our engineered cells are vectors and growth pa induce pathologic activity. And I think probably one of the uh, good examples of that is, is cytokine release syndrome uh, with CAR T cells and neurologic uh, diffuse, I mean, uh, generalized neurologic problems with CAR T cells. And then the, uh, an issue that's more related to, uh, is related to efficacy, but is also a safety concern, is what if our genetically engineered cells lose their fitness or potency? And the reason this isn't simply an efficacy concern is in the hematopoietic world is if you do a full myeloblative transplant and you're replacing the, the hematopoietic system with genetically engineered cells and those stem cells lose their potency, you'll end up with aplastic anemia. So we have to be concerned with this idea not just from an efficacy standpoint but also from a safety standpoint. Now as I mentioned, one of the real challenges in our field is the lack of validated preclinical models. Um, and these are uh, five examples um, of, of what I mean. It's the first, which I'm uh, surprised wasn't mentioned before, is that the large, uh, lo the preclinical large animal models did not predict, actually it was mentioned, did not predict the potent uh, anti-AAV effects that were found in humans. And as far as I know, that problem has still not been solved. And I think that means that anytime we see a lack of an immunologic effect in an inbred mouse or even in an or, uh, or a dog or a non-human primate, we have to be cautious about whether that truly predicts um, whether we won't see an immunologic effect in humans. And similarly, the, uh, the um, oncogenic events induced by insertional oncogenesis using first-generation gamma retrovirus viral vectors was not predicted in preclinical models. Now, subsequently, preclinical models were designed to detect uh, that event, but that, that does, that's a retrospective look. What we want to know is prospectively which ones are going to cause cancer. And this, this is due to probably some fundamental problems, which is uh, when we do mouse experiments, uh, we we keep our mice alive for six months. When we're doing gene therapy in a one-year-old, we expect that human to stay alive for 99 more years. Um, when, we, when we treat a human, we're using hundreds of millions of cells. When we treat a mice, we're using several hundred thousand to a million cells. So the, the scale is very different. And there's probably fundamental differences in tumor genesis between humans and, and non-human uh, and large animal models, including mice. A, a, a particular problem um, in the hematopoietic world, but I think in other worlds, is that the standard NSG mouse model that is used um, only supports a small number of human leukemias, uh, human leukemias. So for example, CLL does not transplant into NSG mice. So if your, gene, if your genome editing your gene therapy leads to uh, predilection to CLL, that cannot be predicted by putting human cells into an NSG mouse. It simply is a gap in the model. 
even other leukemias that do engraft in NSG mice engraft ineffectively. As I mentioned, the cytokine release syndrome and generalized neurologic toxicity was not seen in mice uh, for CAR-T therapies. And then, as I said, the immunoefficient mouse models for tumor genesis and other organs is missing. Nonetheless, despite these lack of validated uh, and effective preclinical models, the regulators expect us to show in vitro and animal testing of safety in toxicology. It's a little bit of a, a conundrum. So uh, there have been some uh, attempts to, to develop better models, and this is uh, a really nice paper um, uh, from Milan, trying to really uh, develop a sensitized mouse model for the genotoxicity of lentiviral vectors. Um, and what they showed is that even with the, quote, best de designed lentiviral vector, self-inactivating self using an internal promoter, an endogenous promoter, uh, a tumor, an endogenous um, internal promoter, the PGK promoter, they still saw in this sensitized mouse model, a CDKN 2A homozygous background, that there was a uh, acceleration of when leukemia occurred. The interesting thing, though, is, is now this was done before we now have a clinical experience with lentiviral vectors in humans, and there's yet to be an, a, a leukemia in a patient or a, a myelodysplastic syndrome in a patient who got a syn lentiviral vector. So now, what do we do with these curves? Do we just say, well, nothing matters, or do we say we need to wait time? So it's hard to know. Similarly, how do we interpret uh, the hepatocellular carcinomas that have developed in mice using AAV vector integrations? How do we determine whether that's a possible risk in humans? The other uh, uh, thing that just, uh, I'll just show a little bit of data is even when we try to engineer leukemias, it's actually quite difficult. So this is work um, that we did, in, mostly done in Mike Cleary's lab. And the idea here, Mike Cleary has been a pioneer. He actually uh, cloned the MLL gene. Um, and this gene is involved in translocations that lead to aggressive and acute uh, both ALLs and AMLs. And so by using talons to engineer translocations between MLL and AF9, you could generate these with high frequency. If they then took these CD34 cells, grew them for 92 days in culture, or around 90 days in culture, such that 100% of the culture now had the translocation, injected a million to two million of these cells into a mice, and then waited for leukemia to develop, a, it was clonal, so only one of these two million cells actually turned into a leukemia, and it took another 90 to 120 days to see that leukemia. So it's possible, but this even trying, even using an, an oncogene or a translocation that in humans is, is thought to be solely sufficient to causing leukemia, it's still very hard to make these models. Now, nonetheless, I think there are things that we do, we, we might propose doing that would never be justified. Um, so for example, it would be hard to imagine anybody saying uh, that we should uh, express an activated form of MYC or an activated form of, of RAS. I think it would be hard to justify, no matter how many safety and toxicology studies you did, to propose using genome editing to knock out a tumor suppressor. And then I think it would be very hard, and I'll talk about this, and again, I uh, showed you in the prior slide how if you make two breaks, you can create translocations. Um, I think it would be very hard to propose to actually make breaks in two genes that are known to cause an oncogenic translocation. Um, so, um, so now going to directly to how could a trans gene cause safety and toxicity issues. I think there's many different ways, but three that I list here is, is that the overexpression of that trans gene somehow perturbs tissue homeostasis, and I'll talk about how that might happen. It could be that the overexpression of the, that trans gene in that cell causes cell death. And then finally, as I mentioned before, there's a possibility that that trans gene activates the cell um, so the cell has um, toxic activity, as has been seen in CAR-T trials. So one, um, so examples of how transgene toxicity could be important is those of you who have spent time in the uh, hemophilia A world or the factor VIII world have learned that there are many cell types that just don't tolerate uh, the expression of factor VIII even at low levels. It's a big complicated protein that gets caught up in the endoplasmic reticulum and so it's just simply toxic. So, but I, th I think another uh, example is in the hematopoietic stem cell world where 
what uh, John Dick's lab has shown is that those, the stem cells rather than the stem and progenitor cells are particularly sensitive to um, the unfolded protein response. And if we're acting, if we're engineering stem, and or stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, to express a new protein that it doesn't normally express, there's a possibility that you will create proteins that aren't folded properly and that will selectively deplete the hematopoietic stem cells rather than the progenitor cells. And, and, and that would be a long-term way that you might end up losing your graft. And I think um, all of the studies, uh, uh, the, the studies um, uh, such as for meta, metachr metachromatic leukodystrophy and adrenal leukodystrophy so far hasn't shown that effect, which is fortunate, but, but I think it's something we have to be uh, careful of. We know that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the promote, one way of adjusting um, the potential toxicity is changing the promoter that we use. And this was just an experiment that we did in which we compared how much GFP was expressed in CD34 cells depending on the promoter that was used. And you can see that depending on the promoter, you got highly different uh, medium fl mean fluorescent intensities, um, even though the overall targeting frequency was essentially same by molecular methods. And this led uh, us to find that it actually does matter. So for example, when we engineered hematopoietic, or CD34 hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, where we expressed GFP from the uh, viral SS SFFV promoter, we found that only about 2% of, of, of the modified cells would engraft, uh, or we only got 2% modified cells to engraft in an NSG mouse. But when we sl switched to an uh, endogenous uh, promoter that gave lower levels of expression, so here versus here, and used a not GFP but a cell surface marker, we now got fourfold increase in engraftment. So simply just changing things seems to increase the ability of cells uh, to engraft. So what are the other ways of controlling transgene toxicity? Well, one way is, of course, to control uh, where it's expressed by altering the promoters. And Axel Schombach today uh, mentioned the idea of engineering the promoter. And this is a review by uh, Cavazana, Antonioni, and Michio showing all the different beta globin vectors that have been designed. But they all share the characteristic of of using regulatory elements such that beta globin is only or only highly expressed in red blood cells so that you don't avoid, so that you can avoid off-target uh, toxicity in other cell lineages which may not tolerate uh, beta globin expression. Another way that we can control where transgenes express, and again, this was mentioned earlier, is the idea that was, have been, was developed in, uh, by uh, Brian Brown and, and, uh, Gert, uh, and, and Gettner and, now, and Neldini, which is to use microRNAs to control lineage-specific expression. And so this was their paper from now over 10 years ago, showing that they could uh, inhibit expression of their transgene uh, in, you, in a monos, monocytic cell line by engineering into their vector a microRNA uh, that was, uh, that selectively deplete, or uh, sorry, engineering into their vector a target site for a microRNA that was only expressed in U937 cells but not in HEK293T cells. So this is another way if you have a transgene that's express, toxic in one cell type but not in another cell type, how to get it to be specifically expressed. So then I want to switch again now to, to geno, the potential toxicities of on-target genome editing. So the idea here is we're going to make a break in a specific site, not worried about off-target breaks per se, but what happens when you make a break at that specific site? When one of the challenges in thinking about using genome editing for autosomal dominant disorders, which you have a pathologic allele, on one pathologic allele and one wild type allele, is in the process of trying to correct the pathologic allele, you'll frequently create indels on the other allele. So you really haven't gotten anywhere. You've just switched alleles uh, in terms of which one's pathologic or not. And so how to, how to avoid that's going to be a real, ch a, a real challenge. A related issue is, say, for an autosomal recessive disease like cystic fibrosis, where there are alleles that are hypomorphic in which there is exciting progress now in terms of modulators that increase the activity of these hypomorphic alleles. You could ima easily imagine that if you use genome editing to try to correct one allele, you would end up inactivating a hypomorphic allele and making that allele and making that cell worse. So how do we avoid making, making sure we don't make the on-target worse than it was uh, before? Before. 
And then uh, the third example, which uh, you know, directly hits at what we're doing, is when you're trying to co correct sickle cell disease and correcting the variant that causes sickle cell disease, you can also create insertions and deletions, which then convert that allele from sickle cell disease to a beta thalassemia null allele. Is that going to be a problem or not? And we certainly have had discussions about that. So I've talked about the, the problems um, of, of trans or the potential problems of translocations, and here's uh, several references and a very complicated uh, PowerPoint diagram that you make a break on one chromosome and another chromosome, um, and you can get a translocation between the two chromosomes. So how frequently does this happen? So in uh, hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells in which we're getting uh, high frequencies of genome editing, uh, the frequency of translocations between two on-target breaks is on the order of 0.2 to 0.3%. In uh, studies that have been referred to earlier about generating universal CAR T cells in which they made a break to knock out CD52 and a break to knock out the T cell receptor, the frequency of translocations, sorry, I got the wrong uh, figure in here, was again between 0.01% and 1%. So these are not small percentages, particularly if you think about uh, engineering hundreds of millions of cells. Now in this case, you're engineering uh, uh, terminally differentiated T cells and creating translocations between genes that have no known uh, uh, oncogenic potential. But the, the, the question would be then, if you were engineering, um, yeah, if you were engineering, uh, uh, what, what about the, sorry, what about the possibility then of the on-target break forming a translocation with an off-target break or a spontaneous break. It doesn't even have to be a nuclease off-target break. It could be a spontaneous break that occurs simultaneously. And if that target site is known to be involved in oncogenesis, like the TCR is known to have fusion partners that can cause, that can cause leukemias, what is the potential risk of that? Um, now, I think clearly the cell type matters so that a terminally differentiated non-proliferative cell is very unlikely to transform, whereas the risk of a stem cell or a progenitor cell that's proliferative of transforming may be higher. But we have no way of really knowing, other than in this very qualitative manner, what the risks are. I would also say, um, in terms of off-target indels, it's not just the nuclease we have to worry about. It's the entire process of engineering cells. So growing cells in culture, which is a mutagenic effect, um, expanding cells, the issue of putting in polyclonal populations versus oligoclonal populations, all are very important in terms of the risk of transformation uh, to leukemia. So how do you assess, and this is an open question, when current molecular methods and functional methods are insensitive? So next generation sequencing methods can only pick up insertions and deletions at a frequency of about 0.01%. And that's really, if you, you know, that's really, a, that's the most sensitive way. And, when, and, and in NGS transplant models, Connie East group showed several years ago that when you put in 100,000 human cells, you only get out about uh, 30 to 60 clones. So you're truly not assessing the entire population. You're only assessing a small number. So these are inefficient, these are not great methods, and yet they're currently the only ones we have. We, talk, uh, we just heard about um, the issue of immunogenicity. I'll just switch here and point out that, uh, just expand a little bit on what Tony mentioned earlier, which is the risk of immunogenicity to the transgene itself. And in this case, this would be to a foreign genome editing nuclease. And so, um, as, as has been mentioned, there's been multiple successful published trials on using AAV vectors to deliver genome editing machinery to mice for the treat, to modification of liver cells and the modification of muscle cells. But as, mentioned, as I mentioned before, these models have been poor predictors of human immunogenicity. Nonetheless, the, the Wagers and Church group showed that in mice treated with an AAV that expressed uh, strep pyogenes Cas9, they developed both, uh, uh, sorry, it's right here, they developed both T cell immunity and antibody humoral mediated immunity to the Cas9 protein, and they could map the epitopes um, that these antibodies were recognizing. So clearly there's the risk that the human immune system, when exposed to something like Cas9 for prolonged periods of time, is going to develop both T cell and humoral immunity um, to, to, uh, to Cas9 and perhaps eliminate or cause organ toxicity. I'll just point out that uh, we have now shown, figured, we have now determined that the pre-existing 
uh, adaptive immunity to uh, Cas9 is quite high. So 75% of healthy human beings have pre-existing humoral immunity to Staph aureus Cas9, and 60% of healthy humans have pre-existing immunity to pyogenes. About 50, we, using an insensitive uh, interferon gamma capture assay, we can find about 50% of uh, PBMs, 50% of people have uh, T cells that are reactive to aureus Cas9. We don't detect any that recognize pyogenes, but as I said, this is an, a pretty insensitive assay. Finally, uh, to the two last things, sorry, I know I'm rushing here, is how do we, uh, how do we uh, weigh benefit versus risk, which is the standard sort of criteria by which you assess um, uh, whether a trial can go, uh, uh, whether we should proceed with a, a clinical trial. The benefit is primarily to the individual, but I think there's also broader social benefits as well. For example, I would like to live in a society that develops cures for people that have uh, genetic and devastating diseases, even if I don't have them personally. The same thing goes to the individual, is, is that they're the risk, I mean. There's risk to the individual, but there's also broader risks as well. Um, should we be doing this in certain patients? And I point out in the US, existing regular, regulatory bodies are very much structured to assess the risk benefit on the individual, but are not uh, structured or even empowered to assess the uh, benefit risk to the broader community. And that really came to the fore uh, around genome editing about how should genome editing be applied to humans and prompted a lot of um, articles and a lot of uh, uh, commentaries and editorials um, and meetings and prompted the formation of an international committee that was tasked with uh, studying the scientific, medical, and ethical considerations of human gene editing. And this is a list of the committee members. Um, and without going through all the details, um, and it was published in, uh, uh, in this report, which is available as a PDF online. And without uh, going through all the details, the committee came up with the following uh, assessment for what's a classic two by two uh, table, which is to class whether we should use somatic cell editing for disease or disease prevention, somatic cell editing for enhancement, germline or heritable editing for enhancement, or germline and heritable editing for disease prevention. And the committee concluded that the current uh, ethical and regulatory structures were in place to put a green light for this. So few were Gene Therapy Society. They didn't put any uh, uh, block on this. But they felt like anything that had to do with enhancement was probably not um, ethically supportable for many different reasons that crossed many different cultures. Uh, the committee actually made a, a rather uh, different decision and said that under very, very specific circumstances, you might consider doing a heritable editing for disease or the prevention of the disease. So that leads me to the question, and so Barry Collar, one of the members of the committee, uh, in, in, our, in the discussion said, um, what we want is healthy babies, not designer babies, and I think uh, that's the correlate of that, is we want healthy humans, uh, not designer humans. But one of the issues then is what if you develop a gene in cell therapy that is developed for the treatment or prevention of a serious disease but could be repurposed for enhancement? How would we assess the risk benefit of a therapy like that? And so those examples include you develop a gene therapy that say enhances uh, muscle regeneration as a treatment for a muscular dystrophy but could be repurposed by an athlete to make uh, their muscles stronger or, or um, similarly, you could imagine a therapy that was developed, uh, a, a gene and cell therapy to treat renal failure and erythropoietin deficiency could be repurposed by athletes. I guess I'm going, always going to athletes. And similarly, something for growth hormone could be repurposed. Now, uh, recom recombinant growth hormone as a medicine has been regulated such that only certain MDs in the US can prescribe it, but the FDA feels like that that's not a very effective long-term method. So do we have to evaluate the risk-benefit ratio of a potential therapy for human disease if there's the potential that once it was licensed, it could be repurposed for something that didn't treat disease? And again, I don't have an answer to that. Um, in the last two slides, or last uh, set of slides, I just want to quickly review what the FDA has given feedback to about what they're expecting in terms of uh, uh, evaluation of safety and toxicity uh, 
at least as it, as it regards editing of hemato CD34 positive hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. This is a paper uh, published um, by David DeGiusto and his colleagues uh, down in the L Los Angeles area about developing um, CCR5 disruption using zinc finger nucleases. And the first thing um, they showed is, is that they measured candidate off-target sites and found that four different off-target sites had measurable frequencies of insertions and deletions. But the FDA uh, agreed that since these off-target sites had no, um, uh, this was in the coding region, these two, uh, two of them were introns and one of them was an uh, intergenic region, um, had, had posed no serious safety concerns, that just simply seeing insertions and deletions was not a reason not to go ahead with a trial. That was complemented by a, full, uh, a GLP toxicology study in which a full human dose of engineered cells was transplanted into uh, NSG mice, and they saw no difference in hematopoiesis um, between engineered cells and non-engineered sh cells, showing that there was hopefully no toxicity. But as I mentioned before, this is a really poor model for what they're trying to do, but it's our best available model. So similarly, we've had the opportunity to talk to the FDA about what they would expect from us for our uh, safety and toxicology data as we develop genome editing for sickle cell disease. And they basically, the same, same two plus, a, well, the, the Sangamo group or the CCR5 group did the same, is first is to look um, at a number of chromosomal spreads um, and look for chromosomal abnormalities grossly by karyotyping. The second is, again, look for insertion and deletion frequencies at a large number of bioinformatically uh, identified off-target sites, um, and then report on that data. And then the third would be, again, to do a full human dose GLP toxin safety study following transplantation into NSG mice. So I've taken you through a whirlwind tour of a lot of things that have to do with just what happens when you do things right and how things could go wrong even if you do things right. So I want to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. Again, thank you.